All right. Uh, hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Noah. I'm from the University of Minnesota, as he said. Uh, I'm an undergraduate studying environmental engineering and computer science. Um, but today I'm here to talk about uh, the work I did as an intern here at Esri this past summer. I worked on uh, Benthic Terrain Modeler, uh, BTM, as we like to call it, and uh, worked on the latest release coming out, which is uh, version 3.0. So for those of you who are not familiar with BTM, it's a Python toolbox and uh, add-in for ArcGIS for desktop. And uh, what it does is it takes your uh, bathymetry data and creates result rasters from that data um, for a variety of metrics to help you better understand the benthic environment. Um, some tools that have been in BTM for a long time are uh, benthic posi or bathymetric position index, or BPI. Um, it can calculate terrain ruggedness. Uh, there's a lot of depth statistics, like mean, variance, standard deviation. And then uh, BTM also comes with a host of classification tools, where you can use all of these metrics to uh, create your own habitat classification schemes and really identify patterns in your uh, terrain data. So a little bit about the background of BTM. Uh, it started out as a collaboration between uh, the NOAA Coastal Services Center and the Davy Jones Locker Seafloor, <laughs> Seafloor Mapping and Marine GIS Lab at Oregon State University. Uh, it was a project of Don Wright, who is now the uh, chief scientist for Esri. Um, she brought it with her to Esri uh, when she came here. Uh, so now it's a project between Esri and the NOAA CESC. Um, in 2012, uh, Don hired Sean Walbridge, who was my mentor for the summer. And he worked to update uh, the software for ArcGIS 10.1 and above. Um, and convert it from uh, what it used to be, a Visual Basic program, into a Python toolbox. So I guess you could say this past summer the baton was handed to me, and uh, I worked on the newest version, which is 3.0. Um, so if you'd like to learn more about the older features of BTM, there's uh, a lot of information online, some great tutorials. The software is free to download. Um, but I'm going to talk about some of the new things coming out in this latest release. So one of the things we emphasized um, for this new release was the capacity to work with benthic, uh, benthic data at multiple scales. Um, so a lot of the tools in BTM uh, produce result rasters using focal operations. And what that is is um, basically you're calculating the result value of a cell in a raster by considering all the cells in a certain area around it. As you can see in this image uh, here, we have a 5 by 5 uh, square that encompasses your focal processing cell. And so all those, the values from all those cells are going to be considered um, when you calculate a statistic or uh, other metrics. And so a lot of the tools that are in BTM now are in the older versions. Um, they usually only work with one scale at a time. So if you wanted to analyze terrain data over uh, multiple scales, you had to do it manually, and it would be a laborious process. Um, but by Providing support for multiple resolutions, um, we hope that it would open up the capability to see patterns that may not be evident at a single scale. So one of the tools that we um, made to facilitate this um, is the Compare Scales of Analysis tool, which is really a pre-processing step that takes a sample of a bathymetric data set and runs a filter over it at up to 25 different spatial scales. Uh, this is an image of an example result using a median filter. But basically, it shows you that there's different patterns that uh, pop out of your data set at different spatial scales. And by visually comparing all these different scales um, in one image, you can kind of choose which would be most useful to you in your analysis. So instead of you know, running the scripts 25 times, producing 25 huge data sets, that would take forever. Instead, you uh, can quickly identify that maybe, in this case, um, a 9x9 nine nine focal window produces uh, unique results from a 45 by 45, but maybe uh, scales at higher resolution scales, or sorry, lower resolution scales would not be as useful to you. And uh, so that would hopefully cut down a lot of the processing time if you were to um, do that sort of analysis. Another new tool that we implemented was um, the R chord ratio, which is a metric that was. Um, defined by uh, Cherie Dupriez from the University of Victoria in a 2015 paper. Um, it's a me measure of terrain ruggedness, but it's unique in that it decouples rugosity or ruggedness from slope. Um, so a lot of the 
uh, classic ruggedness calculations. They're derived um, in a way that doesn't consider that slope and rugosity are two separate metrics that um, may interact but should be separated, especially if you're trying to find, um, identify them as covariates for, say, a habitat suitability model or something like that. And so what uh, Cherie did is basically define this methodology where you find a plane of best fit for your terrain data, and then you calculate rugosity relative to that plane of best fit rather than relative to a horizontal plane. And uh, we, there's also other ruggedness uh, calculations or metrics available in BTM, um, a lot of the more traditional ones, but we included this because we think it'd be uh, really useful if you are doing some sort of um, covariate search or habitat suitability modeling. And this uh, metric comes up in two places in BTM. You can create a raster of ACR, um, like a lot of the other metrics. But uh, a new tool is, um, that I think is really cool is you can draw a polygon of an area of interest over your terrain data, and from that polygon, get a single value of um, ruggedness from that. And so I think both of these are uh, methodologies would be useful in their own right in different situations. And then finally, we added um, some new depth statistics. Uh, BTM currently does mean standard deviation and variance. And we decided to add uh, kurtosis, which is the peakedness of the di distribution of your focal window. Um, and then also uh, interquartile range, which is uh, visualized on the right there. It's if you divide your, the range of your data into four quadrants, it's the middle two quadrants. And so uh, while these, uh, Two new depth statistics are obviously going to be useful. Uh, what was more exciting to me was not uh, the tools themselves, but how we created the tools. So the previous depth statistics in the program were made um, using kind of pre-built Esri uh, Python tools that will you know, calculate the statistics using focal operations for you. And it's all done on the back end. There's really no effort on our part. Um, but kurtosis and interquartile range weren't aren't available. They're not um, products in the Esri Python API that are just ready to go. So we really had to build them from the ground up. And we did that using the NumPy and SciPy libraries, which I'd like to talk a little bit more about. So NumPy and SciPy are, uh, if you're not familiar with them, are scientific computing libraries written in Python. And uh, they both have hundreds and hundreds of tools across all disciplines of science that are really, really uh, useful. Um, Pretty much, if you can imagine some sort of data processing tool, they probably have it. Um, everything from statistics, uh, physics, signal processing, image filtering, machine learning, uh, NumPy and SciPy can probably do it. And so um, the other useful aspect of these libraries is that they're written in Python, which is a really intuitive language. It's easy for beginners to use if you're not familiar with programming. Um, but traditionally, Python is trades that um, ease of use off with efficiency. It's a slow language, and especially when you're processing really large data sets, that's not ideal. But NumPy and SciPy are, um, have a, are run the, through the back end is all written in C. And so um, C is not easy to write. It's not <laughs> easy to use for beginners if you're not familiar with programming. But with NumPy and SciPy, you get that efficiency um, while still having the ease of use of Python. And so NumPy and SciPy ship with ArcGIS Pro and ArcGIS um, ArcMap. So if you have those programs, you have these tools and they're ready to use. And even more, um, the Esri Python API comes with a few tools that allow you to convert common data types such as rasters and tables into uh, forms that are usable by NumPy and SciPy. So the primary data structure of NumPy is the ND array. It's a, what it sounds like, uh, an array that can have as many dimensions as you want. I think the theoretical limit is like 200 dimensions, and I'm not sure why anyone would ever want to mess with that many dimensions, but you can if you want. Um, in our case, we used three-dimensional arrays because that was best for our data. Um, but basically, all the NumPy and SciPy functions run along an axis of your array. And so uh, this is useful, but we found that for spatial data, and especially when you're trying to do focal operations, um, the NumPy array, the ND array, I should say, isn't ready to go for that sort of application. We had to create an algorithm that would um, 
sort of perform these focal operations using the NT array so we could use the tools that are in NumPy and SciPy. So the algorithm that I wrote, um, I'll try to describe it as the least boring way I can. <laughs> um, so basically, let's say we have this 4x4 four four raster you have on the left here. Um, and I'll use this. It's 4x4 four four raster, um, and we want to process it using a 3x3 three three focal neighborhood. So a 3x3 three three neighborhood would, for this cell, the result would be calculated using all these cells. The result for this cell would be calculated using these, and so on. And so what we do is we take, um, if you can imagine a 3x3 three three, uh, focal window, there's nine cells in that window. So what we do is we take nine images of the original raster um, and basically focusing in on separate parts of the raster. And the gray cells you see here are where we're looking at no data values. So we're looking over the edge or over the corner of the raster. And what happens is if you layer all these views of the raster together, um, you get this three-dimensional array that has the original raster preserved in the X and Y, or in the first and second dimensions. But in the third dimension, you have um, stacked behind each value all the values in its focal neighborhood. And so what you can do now is run any NumPy or SciPy function along the third axis of this array, and it will give you your result. Um, so this is very different than the scanning box that we saw before, and that involves this uh, stacking step here. But it's really powerful because using this function, um, you know, we only did kurtosis and interquartile range, but there's a plethora of other um, functions available in these libraries that you could run and uh, perform really fast and efficient uh, spatial analysis um, using ArcGIS for desktop and these libraries. Um, so this code is up on GitHub. If you're interested in spatial computing, I encourage you to go check it out and see what you could do with it. Um, and uh, just looking into NumPy and SciPy is worth it for the capabilities that are available. So a few other uh, highlights from this summer. We tested um, BTM on a lot of really large data sets. Um, bathymetry data usually comes in large sizes because um, the ocean's a big place. <laughs> and uh, so we tested on the scale of you know, five, 10 gigabyte um, data sets and really found where BTM's weak spots were. Um, unsurprisingly, the main weak spots were in these new functions using NumPy and SciPy because these are really memory intensive operations. Uh, so what I did is I implemented a block processing algorithm that basically extracts uh, bits of the original data set at a time to process so that there's never too much in memory and that the, uh, the programs can handle it. We also experimented a lot with NetCDF. Uh, we made BTM fully uh, NetCDF capable so uh, because that's a really common uh, file type for oceanographic data. And then also we experimented with reading from NetCDF files directly from disk so that if you had an extremely large file, you wouldn't have to worry about um, running out of memory. And then I worked on a few other uh, new BTM metrics that I didn't get uh, a chance to finish. One of them was uh, a fractal dimension tool. If you're in, uh, familiar with the idea of fractals, it's the idea of uh, that something at multiple scales is self-similar. Um, so for terrain data, that would mean that at one focal scale, um, there's patterns in the terrain that exist at a larger focal scale. Um, so the fractal dimension is basically a measure of how true this is. Um, so uh, we used this using SciPy, and, uh, or tried to do this using SciPy, and it didn't really get finished, but I uh, know my mentor, Sean Walbridge, wanted to pick it up again, and I'm excited to see uh, where he takes it. So in closing, uh, I'd like to thank Dawn Wright uh, for hiring me this summer and uh, allowing me to work on her, her pet project. Um, thanks a lot to Sean Walbridge, my mentor, for taking a lot of time out of his summer to work with me, um, and then the Esri Geo Processing team for hosting me in their office. And then finally, the University of Minnesota Grant Initiatives Program for providing me with the funding to come out here and present. Um, and with that, I'll take any questions that anyone has.